Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Virginia Military Institute's 11th Annual Leadership and Ethics Conference. I'm Colonel David Gray, Director of VMI Center for Leadership and Ethics, and I'll be the Master of Ceremonies for this conference. Now, I'd like to thank all of our returning guests from previous years and recognize many new participants from across six time zones. We'd also like to thank and acknowledge our conference sponsor, U.S. Army ROTC, for their strong support. Now, while we cannot physically be together for this year's conference, we are determined to give you a flavor for our post, our traditions, and our approach for developing leaders. So ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy our traditional conference opening. BMI's Cadet Color Guard will post our national colors as our herald trumpets play our national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all please give a virtual high five to our Cadet Color Guard and Herald Trumpets. Great job. To open this conference, it is my great honor to introduce Major General Cedric Wins, VMI's Interim Superintendent. General Wins is a 1985 VMI graduate who commissioned in the United States Army in the Field Artillery Branch. During his distinguished 34-year career, General Wins served in many key leadership and staff assignments, including in headquarters, Department of the Army, and on the Joint Staff, both at the Pentagon. In his final command, Major General Wins served as the first commanding general of the U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command. He has earned a bachelor degree in economics and two master's degrees in management and national security and strategic studies from Florida Institute of Technology and the National War College, respectively. Ladies and gentlemen, Major General Wins. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Virginia Military Institute and our 11th Annual Leadership Ethics Conference. Since its start, the conference has addressed challenging issues of national importance. This year's theme, strong leaders, strong teams, is no different. This topic is very relevant today as our nation, states, localities, businesses, and citizens continue to struggle against the effects of COVID-19 
as well as deep cultural and partisan pol politics that divide us. Underscoring this context and the conference's themes are the demands on leaders to demonstrate values-based leadership, wise decision-making, and effective team building to move us forward. Leadership, education, training, and development have always been essential elements of VMI's mission. The Institute strives to prepare our cadets to distinguish themselves as leaders of character and integrity in a world that sorely cries out for leadership. As you will see throughout the course of this conference, effective leaders follow a path that starts with self-awareness, is refined through experiences, and shaped by a constant striving to bring out the best in their teams. Over the next two days, this conference will take you on a progressive leadership journey exploring some key connections between leadership, followership, and teamwork. We are honored to have several distinguished men and women to join us and share their leadership experience at this event. I'd like to personally thank General Richard Neal, Ms. Sherry Harley, Coach Ben Frankley, and General Stan McChrystal for participating in the conference. Their unique knowledge and experiences will fur furnish us with important insights on leading and communicating with teams. In addition, you will be challenged to examine your own values and selected leadership skills through several small group discussions and interactive exercises. VMI's goal is to develop today's current college students to lead now and in the future. With growing experience and skill, they will successfully confront our nation's challenges during this and other global transitions in the future. We are pleased to share leadership insights beyond VMI's campus with all of you attending this conference. We look forward to stimulating discussions with you both during and after this conference through our Center for Leadership and Ethics. We hope you will enjoy the conference and will continue to use the materials and insights gleaned to enlighten your own leadership journeys. Thank you and have a great conference. Thank you, Major General Renz, for a great introduction to Strong Leaders, Strong Teams. Every year, our center chooses a theme that anticipates a topic of national importance to guide our academic year program and as content for our conference. Last year's theme centered on the theme of disruption. Who knew? how timely that would be and turn out to be. This year, our center chose as its annual theme, teamwork, out of many, one. A deliberate play on our national motto as inspiration to meet the challenges of this, the second decade of the 21st century. The idea provided the context for our first ever virtual conference and its theme of strong leaders strong teams. Now, over the next two days, we plan to bring you on that progressive leadership journey that Major General Wins talked about, exploring some key connections between leadership, followership, and teamwork. Today, we'll get a chance to look at our theme through the lens of individual and peer leadership and their impact to teamwork. Tomorrow, we will dive into creating high performance teams and the challenges and opportunities of bringing together people with diverse experiences to create effective teams of teams. Besides hearing from our talented speakers, we will participate in some hands-on interactive exercises to reinforce some key leadership skills. Now at VMI, we have an embedded and an intentional blueprint to develop exemplary cadet leaders and followers. This tiered program is published in the VMI Leader Journey, which can be found on the center's website. Our staff and faculty have a similarly tailored professional development journey. Together, these two programs have contributed to our leaders' self-awareness, knowledge, and ability to create strong teams 
whether in the barracks, in classrooms, or on various sports playing fields. Now we've asked a few of our colleagues serving in a variety of leadership positions at BMI to share their thoughts about leading oneself. Here are a few of their insights. Well, I think that leading self means you need to be self-aware. You need to be aware of your strengths and your weaknesses and also your communication style. It has a number of components. Self-awareness is a big part of that, but also knowledge. And not just knowledge in terms of what I know, but also knowledge in terms of uh, the humility, at least, of knowing what I don't know. I always sort of led myself by the sky, the limit, and where there's a will, there's a way. And so I've just sort of lived my life as under those probably two rules, really. It means being able to uh, take a pattern in your life, to, uh, to understand where your role is, uh, to help other people, but more important, to take care of yourself. Know yourself and seek self-improvement. In order to do that, you have to know your strengths and the, your weaknesses of yourself as an individual and be able to uh, know how to overcome those and actually work towards mitigating your weaknesses and enhancing your strengths. Leading self really means reading, being insightful, reflecting on your strengths, your uh, challenges, your weaknesses, and a lot of uh, lifelong learning. A major goal of the conference is for you to increase your own self-awareness as a leader in a few key areas. Towards that end, we invite you to reflect on our speakers' insights and the results of the various exercises. You can use those reflections to create your own leader action plan, both during and after the conference. Most of you received the conference workbook in the mail, or if you just registered, click on the link on the top of the conference schedule page to download a PDF version of the booklet. We'll be referring to this workbook as we work through the speakers and interactive exercises. It's your place to take notes and it will serve as a reference guide that you can return to in the future. So if you're ready, follow me and let's begin our journey. Now our first speaker is someone with a lifetime leading teams. General Richard Butch Neal has led teams of all shapes and sizes from platoon to large coalition and inner service organizations. As a strategic leader, he has served in a wide range of leadership roles, including being a former assistant commandant of the Marine Corps, a former chairman of the board, for the Military Officers Association of America, and as a senior fellow at the National Defense University. General Neal presently serves on the board of directors for several companies, and he is a member of the board of trustees for Norwich University. He is our leader in residence for this academic year. Now, General Neal is also the author of a book titled, What Now, Lieutenant, that has been added to the Commandant of the Marine Corps' professional reading list. Great read, especially for junior leaders, packed full of practical advice. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome General Butch Neal. Thank you, Colonel Gray. <clears throat> well, good morning to everybody. Happy Monday and happy President's Day. I sure wish that we could be doing this in person so that I could make sure no one falls asleep during my presentation. I know each of you have a workbook for the conference and I hope you find some of what I have to say is worth writing down. I see they only had one page to take notes on during this module. I hope my comments fill it up. Even though I can't see all of you, I do plan to engage with you by asking questions for you to consider as we go along and hopefully to discuss in your icebreaker and small group meetings. 
I'm not asking for answers, but rather hoping that the questions and comments will assist you in your workspaces and in your becoming the leader we and your teammates hope you will be. You'll have an opportunity to ask me questions during the Q&A segment, and I'm sure that, that you'll take advantage of that opportunity. In fact, I hope you do. In all honesty, I do not feel I'm at the, I am the font of all knowledge when it comes to leadership, but I do have some thoughts on leadership to share with you that I hope will assist you in understanding leadership, being a leader, and leading. Truth be known, I must admit that when I was bewildered by this assigned topic when VMI sent it to me. Why? Simply because I never remember knowing myself as a leader. I was just one of the guys that grew up in a small peninsula town south of Boston, where loyalty to each other was really the coin of the realm. Perhaps the closest I came to thinking about leaders was while in high school, identifying those that I thought were leaders. As you might imagine, they were the tallest, the most athletic, and far from the best, and, 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 and the best looking in the high school. This is probably because I was the shortest, the smallest, the least athletic, far from the best looking guy at the high school. Significantly, even though I was always picked last to be on those teams, I was always picked. Why, you might ask? Because everyone knew that I was tough, I was competitive, I was loyal, and most of all, I was a team player. Allow me to share a little background. When I was 10 or 11 years old, we were experiencing some turmoil at home. My mom and dad thought it was best that if they sent me to visit with my uncle and aunt who owned a dairy farm in New Hampshire. Strange as it may seem, it was probably one of the best things that could have happened to me. During those 18 months, my uncle by word and deed instilled in me the meaning of responsibility, self-confidence, accountability, honesty, and the value of a strong worth ethic. You might ask, how did my uncle accomplish this? He was an amazing man gifted with great patience. He sort of put me under his wing as if I was his son and he mentored me. He established trust with me. He taught me how to drive a tractor. Even though I was only 10 going on 11 years old, I learned how to plow the fields, cut the hay, bale it and put it away. I had chores to do. He never checked on me doing those chores. He assumed that I would do them. He established a real feeling of trust between he and I real trust. He gave, he gave me a, an actually a newborn calf, a Holstein calf. And with that came what? Responsibility, confidence, accountability, honesty, and again, the value of a strong worth ethic. Shortly after I turned home, returned home, my dad passed away from lung cancer at the young age of 42. It quickly became apparent both to me and to my mother that those traits my uncle had impressed upon me were invaluable in allowing me to step up in assisting my mom in meeting the demands of a single parent. Those traits stayed with me throughout high school. And in, and in spite of the fact that I did not know myself as a leader, I was elected president of the student council, was a member of the National Honor Society, voted best, best natured and was on the football team with no expectation that I would ever play unless we were so far ahead or so far behind. But you know what? I never missed a practice. And when given the opportunity, I never missed a tackle. Did I see myself as a leader at that time? As I have said, no, but I did know how to capitalize on those strengths that I did have. A quick wit, self-confidence, physical and mental toughness, resilience, and better than average intelligence. Not a great intellect, but better than average. Let's pause for a moment. Consider these questions. Did you know yourself as a leader in high school? Do you see yourself as a leader now? If not, why not? When did you think you might have the right stuff to be a leader? 
Did you really know or even consider what your strengths and weaknesses were? These might be questions you can discuss in your smaller groups. Okay, continuing. These traits and characteristics developed at the farm and in high school and refined as I grew up, served me well while in college and as a candidate in the Marine Corps platoon leaders class. Upon graduating from college, on that afternoon, I raised my right hand and I said, I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office I'm about to enter. So help me God. Now you're probably asking yourself, how did this dude make four-star general in the Marine Corps? It's a good question for sure. Make no mistake, any success I had in the Marine Corps and throughout my life was first and foremost by having the opportunity of working for and observing strong leaders. And just as importantly, having great people working for and with me. Think about it. Who is responsible for building the culture of the team? One based on trust, honesty, integrity, sound judgment, dedication, and moral and physical courage. Who? Who ultimately must develop the talent, communicate the vision, foster the teamwork, set the example, and develop the practice, practices, procedures, and standards for the team? And who must provide the inspiration necessary for the team to overcome obstacles, to navigate through uncertainty, and to accomplish the task at hand? The answer, of course, is the leader. He or she must have set the course and speed for the team by instilling a climate of culture and a climate and culture steeped in mission accomplishment or results attained, while at the same time, keep this in mind, while at the same time remaining focused and unwavering in attention to the relationships and the obligations to their team members. Blending these two behaviors is daunting, yet an absolute and imperative responsibility for leading the team. Let's pause for a moment. Have you thought about these two challenges, balancing the mission results with the needs and responsibilities of leading the team? It ain't easy, believe me. I'm sure you've run into leaders that are mission results oriented, sometimes, listen well, sometimes to and at the expense of the people. I know I have. They may have been strong leaders, but not the kind we are talking about and hoping you will be. This is something I hope you discuss and consider as you go forward as a leader, a follower, or as a teammate. Consider the possibility that a strong leader does not necessarily mean or lead to a strong team. Ask yourself, why, why not? What did he or she not do, or what did he and she do? It made them perhaps a strong leader, but really didn't cover that other part of the leadership package, which is taking care of your people. Something worthy of consideration. So what is it that makes someone stand out as a leader? Perhaps the best way to answer this question is to tell you what is important to me, what I stand for, what characteristics, traits, and values are non-negotiable as far as I'm concerned. They're not the be all and end all, but they should work as a good point of departure for each of you as you make this journey into leader and leadership. I am sure you have gathered from my previous remarks, loyalty, confidence, competence, and trust are of critical importance to me. I learned this growing up and it was reinforced during a battle I was involved in as a young Lieutenant in Vietnam. Before I go on, several had asked me during one of the technology meetings, asked me why the title of my book, What Now Lieutenant? Let me explain. During the workup when I was in the platoon leaders class during the summers while I was in college, many times the staff would, would pick us out and say, Neil, what would you do in this instance? And then they would give me some type of a, either a combat related instance 
before they would give me just a scenario of maybe family troubles or, or a young Marine getting into trouble, why and what, what would I do about it? Likewise, after I was commissioned as a lieutenant after college and went to the basic school at Quantico, again, the staff always gave us these scenarios where they would ask us, what now, Lieutenant? I thought it was a great way to kind of make each of us think about, you know, what are the circumstances surrounding this event? What can I do as a leader to either extenuate or mitigate against what's being suggested by the event? And how do I, as a leader, take charge of this situation? That's where it came from, and what now, Lieutenant? Back to the Vietnam experience. Because of significant casualties in the span of 30 to 45 minutes, I had gone from being an artillery fort observer to an infantry platoon commander and ultimately to an infantry company commander. Essentially, my what now lieutenant moment had arrived. Shortly after the battle, I assembled the surviving leadership of the company. I knew that I had to comfort them over the loss of comrades and at the same time commend them on their actions while reminding them that they were still Marines and that they needed to be prepared should the enemy return. Importantly for you to know, there were 15 killed during that battle and there were 47 wounded. Thus you can understand how important my bringing them together was, was, was an imperative. I kept in mind that I was talking to tough young men who had gone through a life-changing event. Empathy and understanding on my part was required. And it was at that moment that I saw real trust in their eyes, trust that I would get them through this ordeal. And this approach is something I call eyeball level leadership. Facing your people, looking them in the eye, explaining the situation in truthful and sincere terms, and at the same time, encouraging them to know, encouraging them to let you know their thoughts, their ideas, and their concerns, showing them essentially that you care. Since that traumatic event, I have embraced this approach both in the Marine Corps and as the president of three companies, as a mentor, as an educator, as a parent, as a grandmother. Let's pause again for a moment. You might be asking yourself, considering the situation I just talked about in Vietnam, could I have done something like that? Take over the platoon, take over the company. I'm sure you're wondering if you had what it takes to lead in such a dire situation. For me, important question that you should be consider, and I hope you'll discuss in your session is, if you have what it takes to lead where you are now, with your team, with your school, and perhaps later with your country. Okay, let's continue. I found that the key to being a successful leader is to see the organization through the eyes of your people. I repeat, to see the organization through the eyes of your people. What do I mean by that? To me, it allows you to see what's right, it allows you to see what's wrong, and then to work together emphasis on the word together, and then to work together in fixing it. What this does is what it creates is that it creates a climate of trust and loyalty, a culture of engagement, and a commitment in your teammates or in your teammates' followers. Wherever I took over, whenever I took over an organization, while in the military or the civilian world, the first thing I did was to meet with my folks collectively as well as in their workspaces. For example, when I took over a Marine division of some 20,000 people, I met with all of the officers in the base theater, those officers that were not deployed. I did likewise with the senior enlisted leaders. At that time, I told them how I operated and what they could expect from me. And most importantly, what my expectations were of them. I say again, what my expectations were of them. I divested them of the notion of gotcha leadership. I wasn't gonna go looking for dust balls. I wasn't gonna look for if light bulbs were out. I wanted to just encourage them to embrace eyeball level leadership. I emphasized accountability and responsibility. They were responsible for their folks and accountable for all that they did, 
but did not do. I promised them that I had their back as long as they led with both the mission and their people, people's health and welfare uppermost in mind. I spoke of the four words that have served me as guides, have served as guides to me that I did, and I made sure that they remembered and used them in all that they did as leaders, as mentors, as teachers, and as trainers. They are courage, dedication, integrity, and judgment. When I talk about courage, I wasn't focusing on physical courage, but on moral courage to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. I wanted them to feel that I was approachable, that they could talk to me, to be candid, that I welcomed their ideas and yes, their criticism. Asking them, what do you think? Wasn't just a gimmicky phrase for me and my people knew it. I always remember I was inspecting the troops. It was the battalion. I had the battalion command me as I went down the line as a division commander. I came upon a Marine who had just a little bit of a plot over his belt, belt buckle. I put my finger on that little piece of fat and I said, what's this Marine, my good Marine Corps child? And he said, no, sir, that's Domino's Pizza, free delivery. I thought that was great, but he had me. And of course the Colonel being me, there was sweat running down him and he was about ready to melt. So I said to him, I said, how did you do in the last physical fitness test? And he said, sir, 275. The battalion commander shook his head, that was true. So I looked at the young PFC. And I said, well, keep ordering those pizzas. And then I moved on. That's engaged, that's eyeball level leadership. I trusted, I insisted that their moral courage had better always be pointing true north. Another example, at the basic school at Quantico, Virginia, young lieutenants, who had already taken the oath of office that I recited a few seconds ago and during a land navigation exam out in the field, going from point A to point B, using their lens at a compass. They decided that it was a little bit easier bringing along a cell phone than using GPS. They were caught. They went in front of the company, com the, the company commander, or actually they went in front of the, the basic school commander, the full colonel, and he asked them for an explanation. And they said, well, sir, it's much easier to use GPS. It's more precise instead of that old thing called the lens at compass. He said, what about your moral compass? I thought that was a great response and it's something to think about as you go forward. Dedication. Here I emphasize loyalty to the team or the unit, emphasizing trust and open communication. Again, encouraging them to get away from their desk and computer and engaging, engaging by getting out and about with their people. Integrity. Here's the word I most emphasized with them. It was not negotiable or situationally dependent. Rather, it was values and standards based. And here I made sure everyone knew my expectations of them being honest, being forthright, and being trustworthy. And finally, judgment. Here I emphasize decision-making, attention to detail, considering unintended consequences, not simply jumping to conclusions before knowing all the facts, and that extenuation and mitigation should be factored into the decision-making process. I stress the application of something a lot of us forget as we go about our daily thing, the application of common sense when making decisions. For example, if a mistake was made or a failure realized, I learned to stop and ask myself three questions. Listen to these three questions. And I said, I asked myself. That's the important part. I took responsibility. I was accountable for whether they failed or they succeeded. Did I clearly articulate the goal or task? Did I give the team resources and time to accomplish the task? Did I adequately train them for the task? You see the operative word is I. It was my responsibility to meet those three requirements and perhaps you can think of other ones that could cause mistakes to occur that perhaps you should avoid. It was this approach that builds teams and organizations because they feel like you care, you're engaged, you're part of the process. 
This approach coupled with those four words, courage, dedication, integrity, and judgment, and what they meant to me became the cornerstone of my leadership style. Essentially, eyeball level leadership at its best. Let's pause for a moment. Do these four words and what they mean resonate with you? Do you believe that you honestly embrace them in all that you do as a leader or as a teammate? Ask yourself, if not, why not? Importantly, these words in this approach were not my style just in the Marine Corps. Rather, they and this approach worked extremely well in all that I did and do since leaving the Marine Corps. Why? Because these words and this approach builds confidence and engenders trust, generating unity of effort, focusing on we, not me, us, not I. What this essentially does is help your people realize their potential. They also know you care. It builds confidence and engenders trust, generating unity and focusing on we, not I, us, not I, and we, not me. Okay, another story. While traveling to make a speech some years ago, we came upon a truck with a plaque on its back, a big tractor trailer truck. On the plaque, it said, our people make the difference. I really like that. I immediately rewrote my speech that I was driving to and incorporated in, as I am a firm believer, that our people do make the difference. The goal is to make your people feel needed and highly valued, while at the same time, keeping the mission and results uppermost in mind. So it's a blending of these two. Mission focused, results focused if you're a civilian, but at the same time, making sure you take care of the people that are helping you accomplish that mission or achieve those results. They're not separate. You have to meld them together. The leader does the melding. This is critically important and something you have to keep up most in mind as you go forward as a teammate or as a leader. How do you do this? You do by leading by example, by being a role model, by getting out from behind your computer and out of your office space and engaging with your people, as I've mentioned before. In the Marine Corps, it meant being at the dining facility when it opened in the morning to make sure it was on time and the food was adequate in quantity and quality. It meant walking around in the living spaces, work in recreational spaces, and asking such things as, how does that work? Is there a better way of doing this? What do you think? Such actions show that you care about them. It also gives you an insight. See your organization through your people's eyes to repeat. The above worked just as well in every endeavor I did. I was involved in since retiring from the Marine Corps. Whether as a company president in three companies I did run, a senior fellow for the National Defense University, chairman or director of several organizations, or as a mentor, educator, or team member. I always found that folks, I always found that folks responded best if they felt that they were respected, if they were trusted, if they were involved and their input was valued and actively solicited. Let me repeat that. I always found that folks responded best if they felt that they were respected, if they were trusted, if they were involved and engaged and their input was valued and actively solicited. While doing this, leaders should listen. It's a skill that a lot of us have lost because we like to transmit a lot, but we should listen. And as I once read, we should listen aggressively. I like that term, listen aggressively. What that means to me is you give the person speaking to you your complete and undivided attention. How many times have you been talked to by a senior or, and you can tell when he or she's interest level has gone away. They're looking elsewhere, they're looking for the next opportunity to engage somebody else. You treat every conversation as the most important thing at the moment and pick up every good idea by doing this. Importantly, and listen to this, importantly, for those ideas that are not so good, you don't dismiss them out of hand. 
rather you take the time to explain why it's not a good idea, but at the same time you commend the individual for bringing it up and that you look forward to other input from he or she. What's this? Yeah, I'm gonna beat this dead horse, but yes, this eyeball level leadership again at its best. Did I do all of this as a leader without making some mistakes? Of course not. Here are some mistakes I've seen or made along the way. Basically, I've probably made all of them more than just seen. The first one is one you have to listen to and make sure you copy it down. Trying to do it all myself. Heck, I knew I could do anything better than anybody I assigned the task to. But you know what? I had to learn how to delegate. You know why? Because it builds trust. It builds trust in the people around you and it also develops subordinates so that they in fact can move up to leadership positions. Don't try to do it all yourself, even though you may get impatient with whoever you're dealing with. Allow them, give them the opportunity. And even if they kick it in the grandstands once or twice, you learn from that mistake. A mistake is a learning event, unless it's, it's done again and again. The second thing is, you know, we worry about making mistakes, of taking risks, of failure. Don't worry about that. When you're gonna make a decision, when you're gonna do some action, look at the pros and cons, the advantages and disadvantages of them, and then make that damn decision. And if, if it's a mistake, then learn from that mistake and press on. Hiding in an office or behind a computer, I've already addressed that a few times, but it is something that's a problem. Not listening or soliciting opinions, or advice, we've already talked about that. Listening aggressively, seeking the opinions of those around you. Let me tell you, those young Marines I used to deal with and the young people I had in my office as, when I was a president, out of their mouths come great wisdom because they see things from a different vantage point. And it's to my advantage to listen to them and to encourage them to give me ideas from which I can run. And then, as I said before, if the idea doesn't pan for this particular time, commend them for at least putting it forward. Tell them why it wouldn't work and then move on and encourage them to continue to do that. Being afraid to say, I don't know. This is a big problem, particularly for a leader because we think we're the font of all knowledge. We think we know everything. I can remember when I was working for General Schwarzkopf during Desert Storm, I was the deputy director for operations. I ran the war room at night. I probably knew more about what was going on in the command than even General Schwarzkopf did because I was in the J3 shop or the operation shop, another word for it. But we were having real problems and we were getting beat up over the head and shoulders because our public relations campaign, in other words, our briefings to the international press were not going successfully. They had suggested that they use me because I knew everything, but then Schwarzkopf didn't want me to do this. As he said, and I would agree, I was too busy in the war room. But it got to a point when Chairman Powell said, Norm, you got to get the right guy or gal. And so they put me up there in front of the international press. And I was able to answer their questions. But you know, here I was a young, newly selected Brigadier General. You think I wanted to say I don't know in front of the international press, both the U.S. and around the world? Heck no, I didn't want to. But I learned a valuable lesson by saying, I don't know, but I'll get back to you with the answer. And doing that, I established a relationship between me and the press and a sense of trust. They tr trusted that when General Neal said something, you could take to the bank. And once you establish that piece of trust, you've got it going for you in the right direction. So don't ever be afraid of saying, I don't know, whether it's to the international press or it's to young PFC who asks you about something that you should know the answer to. If you don't know the answer, tell them up front, I don't know. Don't try to give them some work around or some gobbledygook. Answer truthfully, be forthright, and then get him the answer as soon as you find out. Often another mistake I saw was being too quick to blame and too slow to commend. I don't like that. It is easy to blame. Blame somebody else. I used to tell the young generals when I was in the when I was a senior fellow 
at the capstone course that all young newly selected generals and admirals had to go through by law. I said, you know, up until this point in your life, you've been able to blame it on they. They did this, they did that, they're making us do this. Yeah, we don't want to be out here, they want us to. Well, it is no longer they, as I told these young generals and admirals, you are now they. Don't blame. This is President's Day. A good thing to remember is when Harry Truman said that he, a plaque that he had on his desk as a president, the buck stops here. You're the leader. The buck stops with you. Accept responsibility. Be accountable. Work your way through it. Don't, don't pass it on and say, well, Jones did this, or my admin chief did this, or whatever. I've seen that so often, it disgusts me. Don't let it happen. Those are just a few of the things. Both you and I know that each of us is different. We have different strengths and weaknesses, likes and dislikes, abilities and shortcomings. However, if we really wanna lead and be a leader, we can through effort succeed in being a leader. You wanna be and you want us to be. Let's pause for the last time and consider these questions. Have you asked yourself what are your strengths and weaknesses? Have you asked folks, listen to this now, have you asked folks that you admire and see as leaders and mentors what they think of your leadership traits, style, and characteristics? If not, why not? My advice, do it. I guarantee you will be surprised by their response and grateful going forward as you become the leader you and we want you to be. For sure, there is no secret sauce that you can drink and magically become a leader. Rather, the secret is to simply meld your desire for accomplishing the mission of making the results with the absolute commitment for taking care of, being loyal to, looking after your teammates. Further, it's building on your strengths while recognizing your weaknesses and dedicating your time, energy, and loyalty to this effort and all that you do. I'll close by circling back to my four words that you as a leader must embrace, believe in, and live. Since this is President's Day, listen to what a former president once said. I've paraphrased it a little bit, but basically it's what he said. For of those to whom much is given, much is required. I would add much is expected. And when at some future date, the High Court of History sits in judgment on each of us, recording whether in our brief span of service, we fulfilled our responsibilities as a leader or as a teammate. Our successes or failure in whatever we do will be measured by our response to four very simple questions. Were we truly men and women of courage? Were we truly men and women of dedication? Were we truly men and women of integrity? Were we truly men and women of judgment? I would encourage you as you grow and go forward that you ask yourself each and every day these four very simple questions containing those four powerful words, courage, dedication, integrity, and judgment. Better yet, as you ask those questions, that you respond to each of those questions with a hearty yes. Thank you for your time and attention. I wish you well going forward and in becoming the leader and teammate we all want you to be. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for those great insights into leading yourself and leading teams. So we do have some time to take some questions from the audience. And I'm gonna ask Lieutenant Colonel Kim Conley, our Assistant Director for Conferences and Programs to help us funnel the questions to the general. So Thank you, please. Colonel Gray. Thank you, Colonel Gray. Uh, if you have a question, please use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen and we'll call on you and you will get to ask your question live. 
So if you do have a question, use the raise hand button and we will uh, get to you. All right, we have a question from Troy Smith. Go ahead and Troy and ask your question. All right, thank you so much uh, for speaking to us today, General Neal. Um, I have a question for the group. What advice would you give to your 21 year old self that, that we can start following and preparing for right now? You came in a little bit gargled, uh, Troy. Can you can you restate the question, please? Of course, sir. Um, my question was, what advice would you give to your 21-year-old self? <laughs> well, you trapped me, my man. <laughs> That's a good question. I guess if I was a 21-year-old right at the moment, uh, the thing I would really concentrate my effort on would being to develop the skill set of being a good listener and a good communicator. Those are the kind of skills that um, have atrophied over the years because so often um, we listen to a lot of things, uh, you know, that are coming out of different size pieces of equipment, but we don't really listen well. And we are much more comfortable transmitting. Uh, we like to talk and that's, it's, um, it's I instead of we, it's me instead of they. And that's the thing you have to, I think that's something you have to work at. And also, you know, I use that phrase, eyeball level leadership. It's kind of, it's, it's got a nice sound to it, but I really embrace it. Um, obviously I learned it the, not the hard way, but I mean, it became in spades part of my, my psyche as a result of that combat time in Vietnam. Um, but then by sharing it with young people around there, I just saw that uh, it resonated with them. So as a 21 year old, I guess the thing I, I would really impress upon you if given the opportunity is seek out the advice of someone that you admire as a leader and ask him or her, you know, what's your assessment of my leadership skills or lack thereof? Uh, what do you see as my weaknesses? What do you see of my strengths? And then from that, you build it on yourself or I build it for myself as you're asking it of me. I think that's where it is. I, I had the good benefit um, and I'll go back to the Vietnam experience of watching a young captain uh, leading us before this terrible event. I moved to another company as the Ford Observer. I wasn't with that captain anymore, but I looked at the, the new lieutenants that were leading platoons. I was the Ford Observer, so I had the, the real ability to be able to sit down and watch people. And I watched and I learned and I observed. And if I didn't know what I was saying or if I didn't like what I was saying, I'd ask questions. And that's the real key is not to be shy or un, uh, disinclined to ask people questions about how does that work? What do you think? Man, oh man, how many times I ask young troops as a division commander, what do you think? And then they would spout off. And let me tell you, out of the babes comes wisdom. So all of those things, I, I don't think I answered your question, but uh, I appreciate the question. And if I didn't hit me again, I'll try it again. No, oh, you did perfectly. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, Troy. We, we have another question from Benjamin Ashmore. Go ahead, Benjamin. Good morning, sir. So I have a more of a general question. Um, in your experience and career, did you find that leadership got easier to do over time? Say that again, Ben. Uh, sir, in your career, did you find that um, leadership got easier to do over time? You saying moves? Did leadership get easier to do over time in your career? Um, I don't know, Kim, can you, Sure. I can't, either I'm not getting a good sound or it's not. I think if people have masks on, it's a little bit harder. So if you do yeah. ask a question and you have a mask on, go ahead and remove it for the question. You said, um, did leadership become easier over time? Did what easier over time? Leadership 
become being a leader does oh, okay. it become easier? Um, you know, that's a fair question, Benjamin. I think um, it probably did because you became the more seasoned you became as a follower, a teammate, or as a leader, uh, the more you saw the important attributes of being a leader. And so it, it did become easier over time because your confidence built was building, your competence was building because you had more experience. And so, uh, yeah, I think it does get uh, easier over, or it did get easier over time because you, um, you kind of had seen that, done that a few times. And when you've experienced something uh, from which you have to make a decision or which translates into leadership of people, subordinates, or of dealing with seniors, uh, you become um, much more, um, probably much better at it. I always remember I was a young Colonel and I was down to Central Command down to Tampa, Florida, which was responsible for everything over in the uh, Middle East. And we had a four-star general, he was a Marine in fact, who was a tough guy. Uh, he is notorious for, um, for relieving people. In other words, kicking them out, firing them, I guess is, is a good civilian term. And one day, and he was also very experienced four-star, obviously. He was very experienced in the operations and functioning of the Joint Staff, Washington, D.C., the Pentagon. And we had this document that um, he probably wrote himself, and it was my responsibility to um, go through the document with him, and then if there were things he wanted changed, I would go forward to the Pentagon and, and request those changes. So we were all in the war room down there at Central Command in Tampa, and I was briefing the general on the result of my conversations with the people up at the Pentagon. And he said, so I went over and I gave it and I said, and sir, this one item that you didn't like that you wanted to have changed, they weren't, they said that they can't make the change right now, but they would make change in the next edition of the paper. And he jumped up from his desk and he, and he said, stop. And you know, the silence in the room, they were all generals and admirals, the silence was deafening. And I think all of them thought that I was about to be fired. And he said, you know something, Neil, that's the problem with you. You've been an operator too long. You're naive when it comes to joint business. Well, of course my Irish temper over, overrode my brain. And I said, sir, I may be naive, but I'm not wrong. Well, he looked at me for what seemed like an eternity and uh, he finally said, proceed. And I continued the briefing. Everyone thought that I was toast, that, that was, I was on the way out. But you know what? He never apologized for embarrassing in front of those people. But from that day on, I could say the floor is green, even though it's red. And I think he'd say, yeah, I do see some green in there. So I think being candid, being forthright, that comes with, with, uh, with experience. Uh, and, and I found that leaders like to have people telling them what they really think rather than what they'd like to hear. I always remember General, General Schwarzkopf when I, I was beamed in it. I was a new, as I said, a new BG and they needed someone to be the deputy for ops and they asked for nominations from the Army and the Navy and Marine Corps and Air Force and Schwarzkopf picked me. And the reason he picked me is because I had spent three years at Central Command previously as a colonel. So I knew the command and I, I knew the area of responsibility. Well, I can still remember Schwarzkopf when I reported in, you know, General Neal reporting as ordered. He said, he talked for a few minutes and he said, I want you to go around the command and come back and tell me what you see if there's things that have to be changed. So I went around the command. I didn't like the assignment because I didn't want to be I didn't want to be uh, considered the spy. And, but anyways, I did as I was instructed. I came back to him and I said, well, sir, there's some things that I think that this command is not ready if we go to war to, to help you in making command decisions. And he said, God damn it, Neil. That's exactly what I thought. 
That's why I got you here. I want you to tell me when I'm showing my underwear. And that was just another learning experience. People like, you know, leaders want to be told the truth. They want you to be candid, even if it is critical and criticism. And so I think as you get older, 21 is not very old, but as you leading, leading gets leading gets easier because you've got more in your kit bag to draw upon in order to uh, balance it against whatever the position is or mistake or the concern is of the leader. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, sir. We have a question from Eric Monroe. Eric, can you go ahead and ask your question? Hello, sir. Uh, earlier during your talk, you were talking about personal accountability as a leader and three questions you should ask yourself if things don't turn out well. Um, you said that we need to ask if we've clearly articulated the task, uh, given our team the time and resources to accomplish the task, and did we properly train them. Now, of those three questions, have you noticed throughout your career that it's one of those that tends to be the common mistake or pitfall or deficiency in a situation? And how can we take steps to address that common deficiency? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I don't know if I could break any of the three out as first among equals. Each one, they kind of roll into each other. You know, the first one that I articulate the goal or task at hand. If things can be misunderstood, they can be misunderstood. So you have to be really careful on how you, you assign a task. Well, at the same time, you know, you got to make sure you give the people the resources to do it, uh, to accomplish the, ta the, the task. Um, and then, you know, again, going back to the third one I had down there, and they were in no particular order the way I put them. It, were they trained for the task? You can't assign a mechanic to go out and shoot an artillery round unless he gets trained in shooting that artillery round. You can't assign another thing just using the same type of example. So I want to make sure that um, I don't think there's any first among equals of those three. I think they all collectively have to be considered uh, before, um, before a mistake is made. The biggest question is after you, after you get through, if in fact a mistake is made, is learning from that mistake. If you don't learn from a mistake, you're going to make it again. So they're really, that's, you kind of apply these things after the after the fact a little bit, or you should be thinking about it before you even assign a mission. But after the fact, you want to apply these three and say, gee, did I kick one or two of these into the grandstands? And if so, how can I fix that? And then make sure you get the, the culprit or the individual that's been, that's been uh, charged with a mistake and try to make sure that he or she learns from uh, the mistake. Because sometimes you might've given them the right you might have articulated the mission, you might have given them resources and time, and you might have given them uh, the, the ac adequate training and they still make a mistake. Well, there's something to learn from that. Where can you, where can you adjust the bolt, so to speak, to help them not, not make, a, the second, uh, make the mistake a second time around? I hope that helps. Okay, sir, we have time for probably one or two more questions. We have another one from Aaron Cross Kaplan. So Aaron, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, General Neal. You spoke a little bit about personal accountability and the importance of taking responsibility for your actions. I was wondering, sir, if you'd be able to also speak a little bit about the importance of peer accountability and how we can improve our ability to work together and hold each other accountable. Yeah, and that's a good question. Um, yeah, peer accountability, uh, personal accountability is one thing. I think peer accountability is really, it's probably another way of looking or saying teamwork. How do you bring out the best in the team? How do you make the peers realize that um, what you are asking them to do or not do is in line with what, uh, what the mission is at hand. 
I, I think it's all, a, it, it goes back to that sense of building trust, of being forthright, of being candid. Uh, all of those things, they all meld together and they're all critically important to make sure that the individual um, or the people that you are working around, the peers in particular, because sometimes they look at you and they say, well, why is he or she the leader and why aren't I the leader? Well, I think what you got to do is make sure that um, we go back to my listen aggressively piece. You make sure that you involve them, you engage them in the process, make them feel like they're co-equal, even though you may have the rank as a result of position or result of uh, promotion or whatever the case may be, but make them feel like they're part of it. Be honest with them. Ask them, what do you think? And if in fact they come out with some brainstorm that really is a solution to whatever the task may be, make sure that you give them credit. In other words, divest yourself for the eye and say, hey, Joan did a super job in bringing us to closure on this particular problem. And I wanna make sure everybody understands that. So I think you don't co-opt them, you basically bring them into the tent as part of the solution to the problems. You make them feel that, in fact, um, you recognize their value to the team effort. In fact, you got to make sure that every member of the team is recognized as, as contributing to the success of the team and that you're looking for good ideas from all of them. You know, you, you've been on teams, I'm sure you have been, where we're all kind of equal except for somebody says, okay, Neil, you're the leader. And I'm sure some people look at each other and say, well, why the hell is Neil a leader? Why can't it be Aaron? Why can't it be... Colonel Connolly. Well, I think what you got to do is, is number one, you got to make sure that people feel like you should be the leader. But at the same time, by being a leader doesn't mean that you're all knowing the font of all knowledge. But the real leader that brings out peers and peer support is the ones that bring them into the tent, into the decision making process, and make them feel like they are a part of the solution rather than a problem to the solution. I hope that helps. Thank you, sir. We, we have time. We have a couple minutes left. We have one final question from Jake Yates. Go ahead, Jake, and ask your question. Uh, hello, sir. This is uh, Jake Yates from uh, MMI. Um, I was just wondering, do you think your experiences in Vietnam made you the leader you are today? Um, that's a good question. The thought I had uh, during the presentation that I told you about uh, eyeball level leadership, that was born as a result of what occurred in Vietnam. Um, I guess the biggest thing that, that I came out of Vietnam with is um, the importance of building trust, the importance of competence, and the importance of confidence. I think those three, in fact, I could go back to my four words that we've talked about before, courage, dedication, integrity, and, and judgment. All of those things were probably born and refined as a result of my Vietnam experience. You've got to remember, I was just a young lieutenant. I think I was 22, 23 years old. My only experience had been through the schools that the Marine Corps provided in, in before they sent me over to Vietnam. I was a Ford observer, so I went to an army school out at um, Fort Still, Oklahoma for artillery. Uh, I didn't really have, except for what was done at the basic school where every, every Marine is considered a rifleman, I didn't really have a lot of training as a result of being an infantry platoon commander. But during that battle, I had to take over an infantry platoon because my best man, friend of mine, Lieutenant, was seriously wounded. I took over his platoon and then the Ford Air Controller and the company commander were both killed. So I took over those two responsibilities. Did I know all of that stuff? No, but I was confident that, I, that what I was doing was right. Plus I was, I'm, I'm a good observer. I watch, I watch and I learn. And uh, that platoon commander who was seriously wounded, he had trained his platoon great. All I had to do was take over. I gave a couple orders. We continued to march and we, and we beat back the enemy. The Ford Air Controller, I had watched him call in air before, so I knew how to do that. The company commander, 
I just learned by doing. And again, bringing all of the remaining leadership that I told you about, brought them together and sat down and talked to them. I, I saw her in them. They trusted me. They even knew that I was sure they knew I was the artillery fort observer, but I was an officer. So I had to have, you know, some brains, not a lot, but some. Uh, and and they, just, they just trusted that I would get them out of this dilemma. And we did, but we did it together. And I think, you know, I talked about empathy. I talked about all of those types of words. They really have meaning. They really have meaning when you're dealing with people. So I think what I learned from my Vietnam experience and, 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 and the years that followed that Vietnam, I went back to Vietnam three years later. Those experiences um, stayed with me forever. Um, and I saw so many things through the prism of eyeball level leadership, um, both in the civilian world and in the military world. I hope that answers your question, Jake. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience for some great questions that teased out our subject today. Uh, sir, thanks again for some inspiration for our young leaders today. So on behalf of the superintendent, the faculty and the staff and the Corps cadets, please accept this small token of appreciation. This token, since you already talked about a compass to guide us morally and really physically on our leadership journey, sir, we'll get this in the mail to you to keep uh, you on, on azimuth and us on azimuth as we go forward this year. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate it. And I wish you and all the participants uh, the very best during the remainder of the conference.